Okay. Thank you, Rhonda. Hello. I'm going to act like we were recording the whole time. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, um, for those of you who are new to our Bull City Gardener Talks, I just wanted to give a quick shout out reminder that we have um, a number of talks still coming up. We have the good, the bad, and the bugly as the last talk in this series. That's going to be all about pest management in the garden. Uh, spoiler alert, my version of pest management tends to be get you to love insects so you are more comfortable with them. So it uh, continues to be kind of a biology fun fact smorgasbord. We also have a number of talks that we are doing out at Briggs Avenue Community Garden. These are really nice because they are somewhat shorter. They're about an hour long. Two different topics are covered, very hands-on, very interesting. Um, so we have a bunch of those coming up. That series is going through the year, so check it out. And for those who are totally new to Cooperative Extension, I just want to give a quick shout out to kind of the organization that we're part of. Cooperative Extension is a nationwide network of researchers, educators, and volunteers. Here in Durham County, we are a partnership between NC State University, NC a and State University, and also Durham County. So we get funding from all those sources. And our mission is really to bring resource, uh, research-based resources to the community and to the citizens of, Dur of Durham. This is a picture I absolutely love of the Master Gardeners. Uh, this is a program that I oversee here in Durham, and it's an absolute delight. They are the folks who are really kind of the boots on the ground, getting folks answers about gardens and landscaping. Any of your weird questions, they want to hear them. If you ever need help with anything and you want to reach out to the Durham County Master Gardeners, you can reach us at mastergardener at dconc.gov or at this phone number. During kind of more normal times, we also have office hours at 721 Foster Street, which is our downtown office. Um, sorry, I'm trying to make sure my screen's working right. <laughs> and so this is a great way if you are like, what is this weird bug? What are these spots on my leaves? Why, what kind of plant should I plant in this weird wet spot? absolutely reach out to the Master Gardeners. They can provide you so much interesting information, so much context, so many answers. Um, and if they can't figure it out, we'll work together and we will get it figured out. That's one of the cool things about Cooperative Extension is that because we're part of these university systems and because we're part of these larger partnerships, we always have specialists we can call on to get your questions answered. If you want to learn from the Master Gardeners in a more, in a, or in a less reach out and contact them sort of way, we also have a number of different social media accounts. We have a blog, Facebook, and Instagram where we're always sharing up-to-date content, new pictures, all sorts of interesting stuff. This is kind of the full range from like gardening fun facts to uh, native spring ephemerals that someone found on their walk. So there's a lot of really interesting kind of diverse content on there. And it's a really good way just to get information, facts, cool things for Durham County specifically. So with our Obligatory getting to know cooperative extension slides uh, done. We're going to move on to a little bit of an overview of what tonight's talk will be about. So to start, we are going to talk a little bit about tree biology. Um, I think it's really hard to feel comfortable moving forward with trees in general if we don't understand a little bit about what they're about. Uh, what do trees need? Right tree, right place. Uh, we're going to cover planting 101. And finally, we are going to cover pruning. Um, with some kind of how-to steps, different types of pruning for different circumstances, um, and how to find an arborist <laughs> for when you decide that it's maybe a little bit too much that you're taking on. So, sorry, my uh, PowerPoint is futzing out. So a little bit about trees and why we might want trees, right? So some of the really classic examples we think are from the landscape and a lot of gardeners take on are things like, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I know. I forgot that I started my slide blank on accident. Sorry, you guys. Um, so we think about hedgerows, we think about screening, we think about trees in a very utilitarian sense. Um, this is something that we often get a lot of calls about are what are good trees for screening. Um, this is a great row of Nellie Stevens hollies. Um, pro tip for those keeping track at home, I would recommend doing mixed plantings instead of straight species plantings like this, just in case you ever get disease or um, kind of other problems moving in. But this is a reason a lot of people are going to plant trees, right? People also plant trees for just absolute beauty, right? So this is a collection of different types of Japanese maple in fall, right? So they're turning different colors. They have all these beautiful forms. Um, other reasons we might plant trees are for other attributes we find beautiful about them. So things like exfoliating bark on this beautiful lace bark elm, right? This is really spectacular. And as the tree gets older, it only gets better. 
Um, we have a number of different species that grow around here that have exfoliating bark, um, kind of probably most famous is crepe myrtle. And these are all just very spectacular trees and provide even very good winter interest. Here in Durham, right, a major thing about our trees is our willow oaks. They provide a tremendous amount of shade. They provide canopy cover. Um, there's a lot of research about trees actually showing that the sort of shade they can provide can reduce temperatures on the ground up to 10 degrees. Uh, I know that I myself plan my walks to stay in shade during the summer, right? And it's really, really obvious when I'm under shade versus just kind of on open asphalt. There's really interesting stuff going on too with trees where even having a good canopy cover like this, aside from even just um, increasing shade, so decreasing temperatures, which also can decrease home cooling costs, they find that even good canopy cover and good uh, kind of greening of areas can do things you wouldn't even expect it would be possible to do, right? It can thing, do things like reduce violent crime rates, right? Research that you're just kind of like, that can't be right. And then you look into it and time after time and after time again, they find that it really increases kind of overall quality of living. Trees can also provide beauty in terms of their flowers. They can provide all sorts of resources to um, local animals, to local insects. They can provide any number of different attributes and sometimes they're just really cool and weird, um, right? Sometimes that's something you're gonna be looking for in a tree. This is one of my absolute favorite, bald cypress, right? This is a tree that not only is it um, a needle tree that sheds its needles, which seems strange, but also when it's in wet conditions, it's gonna throw out these knees, right? And so those are actually coming out of the ground and they look kind of like alien and strange. And so when it grows in drier conditions, it doesn't do that. It's only when it's underwater and very near water that it's gonna do that, which I just think is like super cool. And so what you can see here, right, is that there's a number of different reasons you might want to plant a tree, a number of different reasons you might want to care for a tree, and they kind of can do the full range of things, right? One of the things we were talking about before we got started is that I feel like a lot of home gardeners, myself included, we don't really think about trees because they're on a different scale than we're used to, both in terms of size and time frame. Uh, but they provide just a tremendous benefit to our landscapes. And one of the most obvious ways that they do that is actually in the way that they provide vital habitat for um, any number of different other species, both plants and animals. So native trees serve as hosts to numerous other organisms throughout their life cycle. So one of the absolute uh, classics that you will be familiar with from our native plants talk, if you were, uh, if you attended that, is this book, Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy. And so this was a book in which Doug Tallamy, who is a um, entomologist, so he studies insects at the University of Delaware, he wrote this whole amazing, beautiful book about, you know, kind of the way that we can support native habitat in our yards. And he really spent a lot of time thinking about oaks specifically, so much so that his book that came out just this year, right, is The Nature of Oaks. So this is something that is really amazing. We'll talk more about oaks later, but oaks, native oaks especially, can support over 400 different species of insects uh, and other animals. And so they provide these kind of almost like keystone elements for our native habitats because they're providing flowers, they're providing acorns, they're providing um, bark habitat for insects that birds are going to come along and eat. Um, underneath they will have kind of sometimes even parasites on their roots providing habitat for that. So there are these really, really, really actually central plants in our landscape in terms of an eco ecological perspective. I think it's just amazing. Um, I personally think that uh, I have this, I will, I will be totally upfront when I was preparing for this talk. Uh, my dad is both a forester and a big bird photographer. And so I just kept calling him being like, dad, I need a picture of this animal on that native plant. He would just keep sending them. And he had so many of them over and over and over again because A, he's looking for it, but B, it's really, really present and really, really obvious um, how much trees are serving as a support for basically everything around them from uh, an environmental perspective. So that's another reason, right? So trees are good for us, trees are good for the environment. There's really no reason you wouldn't wanna add a tree or two if you could and to take care of the ones you already have. Thinking a little bit about tree biology, um, I just wanted to start out with making this point that I think these are both pictures from the JC Ralston Arboretum. This is from their um, annual and perennial color trials. So these are plants they plant every year just to see how they do and to report back. And this is from obviously more like the Arboretum portion. And you have a Japanese maple and you have some other trees around here. And so I think that a lot of us think about these as being really different types of plants to the point where sometimes we don't even see the trees as plants, right? We see them as like, sculptural elements or like architectural elements, right? 
But these plants actually have way more in common than they have different. And so I would argue that if you can understand what's going on here, and if you can understand this plant biology, this is all kind of a needed, like a natural growth from that, right? And it all makes total sense. So I know that I had a tree in my own yard that needed a lot of work and needed a lot of support and bracing, had an arborist come and look at it. And I was very like tentative and like, I don't know if I know how to do this. You know, it seems so big, it seems so scary. And the person was just like, you can stake a tomato. I was like, yeah, but this is totally different. It's like, no, it's not actually that different. You just can't use like pieces of bamboo. You have to use steel rods, right? So just understanding that these are really not that far apart. And there's really kind of the central element of what makes plants special. So most importantly, and we'll come back to this over and over again, is that plants use sunlight to convert CO2 to sugar, right? This is the photosynthetic process. It's actually really, really amazing. They're able to take CO2 and a little bit of water and in the presence of sunlight, turn it into sugar, right? Turn it into glucose and give off oxygen. And so this is really amazing because it means that all of these leaves are little sugar producing factories. And from those little sugar producing factories, they are going to be able to build structures, survive and reproduce, right? So those leaves are essential. This is why when you think about something like um, the canker worms that we have here in Durham, right? They come out and they defoliate all the leaves. The problem there is actually that like they have eaten all the little power factories, right? And if the plant has to produce more power factories, produce more leaves, that's a problem and it's really energy intensive, right? But this is really the central thing that draws together most plants. I will say most plants because the exception, and I'm just saying this because I think they're so cool, uh, are some of the plants that have no chlorophyll. They're, they are not green and it's because they're parasites. So this is Monotropa uniflora. This is um, often on beech tree roots. So a lot of times if you're in a forest with a lot of beech in it, you'll see this kind of on the ground coming up, blooming periodically. And I just think it's so cool that there are plants out there that can't photosynthesize and they are just parasites. But for the most part, most things, right? We're talking about sugar production and that's really, trees are basically able to build these entire massive structures, largely out of carbon dioxide that they pull out of the air, right? Which is actually pretty crazy. Thinking about tree growth is very, very important. So trees add cells at meristems. Meristems are these special little pockets of, they're almost like stem cells. They really are stem cells. And trees can add them can add cells either in a primary way, so they can add by making themselves longer, or in a secondary way, which is by making themselves wider, right? So like the way the trunk of a tree grows out. And so there are meristems both at the tips of the shoots and at the tips of the roots. So this is a root meristem right down here. There's this like special little population of stem cells, and it basically is putting cells out the back and it's being pushed along. And so part of what is really important about this, and this is a central thing about trees that is like, again, hard to, it's a central thing about plants. And I find it really hard to wrap my head around, but it's true. Plant cells don't move, okay? And the reason I'm harping on that is because if there is a tree branch that is at a certain height, it will never go up or down. The tree might grow up, but that tree will always be at that, that branch will always be at that height, right? Because those plant cells are not gonna move. And so the reason that that's really important is we'll come back to that when we talk about how trees heal themselves. We'll come back to that when we talk about how we wanna go about pruning, all of these different things, because you have to keep in mind that it's not like us, right? Where our cells can move and they can repair and they can do all these special things, right? Plant cells, once they are laid down in a certain position, they will never move again. So plants can elongate from both the tip of the shoot and from buds along the shoot. So up here, you'll see this is a meristem, Right, so the staining on this is basically what you're looking at is you were looking at a cut um, and a like a zoomed in version of plant cells, right? And so this is the tip of the shoot and there's staining here for basically those stem cells, right? That meristem tissue. And that's kind of where the plant can grow from, right? Where it can add cells from. You'll see that there's also really dark, heavy staining down here, right? That's what we think of when we think of those side buds, right? So oftentimes, you know, for example, on a basil plant, you harvest basil by pinching back because then those side buds will go out and they'll do this. And so oftentimes when you prune and then all of a sudden it, you know, the thing explodes out laterally. And it's because this point up here, this meristem here is suppressing growth down here. 
So when you remove that meristem, the growth lower is going to explode back out, right? And that's just a really important thing also to keep in mind, and we'll come back to with pruning, is what are your goals, you know? And all of this is to say, if we understand how these plants grow, if we understand what they're kind of biologically programmed to do, we can make better choices about how we care for them. Another fun little asterisk, just a thing to keep in mind, we won't talk that much about evergreens today, about pines, but one thing to be very aware of is that narrow-leaved evergreens, and especially pines, don't always have axillary buds. They don't always have these side buds, right? So you might be aware of this, right? Where if you have a pine tree and you cut a branch back, it doesn't send out a bunch of other little branches the way something like an oak tree might, right? It, you will just have an open spot in your pine tree and it will actually have a really hard time ever repairing that. So once you open a lot of narrow leaf evergreens up, like once you start pruning them and you kind of open up that structure, the structure is like not really gonna repair itself because they just don't even have those buds present. And so that's just something to be aware of when you're pruning those trees. Um, and I would say to slow down and maybe even consult someone before you take those on, just because you can kind of mess up their form in a way that they can't recover from. So that's a little bit about how trees grow, right? They grow up and they grow out. Now we need to think about basically how they move water and sugar within themselves. So xylem is a specialized tissue that transports water and nutrients from roots to leaves, right? So xylem is kind of a flow up, right? You can see just like this. And xylem is super cool actually because this is just like a biology fun fact that I, maybe a physics fun fact. I don't know, I love it though. So what is actually pulling this water up is often actually just the pressure created by water evaporating off the top of the plant. <laughs> so the, the water evaporating off the top of the plant and from different openings on the plant is enough to basically pull the water up these tubes, which I think is really crazy. Phloem, on the other hand, transports sugars from leaves to the rest of the plant. So phloem is how you get all these sugars from out here and you move them down to the roots for storage, right? This is a potato. You can see this is where you're storing some of those sugars and it moves in a little bit more of different directions, but I tend to remember it as phloem food, right? So phloem is all about moving those sugars, moving that food throughout the plant. And so for trees, especially, the xylem and the phloem are actually arranged in rings. So this is the xylem on the outside, right? So you can see these rings. Here's a ring, here's a ring, right? Here are some rings that kind of look like they're verging into each other, but you can tell they're rings. Xylem's on the outside, phloem's on the inside right here. And then this red stained ring, right? This is another cross section of a plant stem where they have stained the cells. This red ring is called the cambium. And the cambium on a tree is extremely important because the cambium on a tree is that place where you get the widening growth from, right? That's secondary growth. The cambium is actually meristem tissue on a tree. And so the reason that matters and the reason maybe you've ever noticed is like one of the tricks you can do is if you have a tree or you have a woody plant and you're not sure if it's surviving the winter right, you know, you can go out and you scratch, you scratch it with your nail back down to that bright green layer. And if you can see the bright green layer, it's, it's healthy and it's fine. That's the cambium layer, right? That's the actual growth point and so if you were to look, you would see that actually, so this is a cross section across a twig. This cambium is that vascular layer we were just talking about. This teal layer right here wraps all the way around the tree. That's how water and sugar moves through the tree. And what's really interesting is that by the time you get to the very middle of that tree here in this diagram and here in this picture, that's not living wood anymore, that's heartwood. Um, it is basically just structural at that point. Um, it doesn't do well at protecting itself against decay. It is dead, right? So the center of a tree is dead because basically what's happening is as the tree is getting wider, that cambium layer is moving out, 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 out. And all this stuff in the middle is basically dying. And so you look at these massive trees, right? That are so big, you can't even like hug your way around them. But the kind of real living bleeding edge of that tree is that very thin cambium layer right around the outside right under the bark, you know, you can almost scrape down to it. And so that's the sort of situation, right, where when they talk about, oh, if you hit a tree with a weed whacker, or, oh, if it gets girdled, you can kill a big tree just by damaging that cambium layer. Because, right, if I were to go through and on the, on the biggest imaginable tree, 
if I were to cut down just a couple inches all the way around, I would cut through that cambium layer and I would cut the connection between the top and the bottom of the tree. Waters and sugars couldn't move, right? And we're like at game over. And so as the tree grows out and the cambium layer moves out, that's actually how you get the creation of these annual growth rings, right? These are all about basically how much the cambium grew each year. And so something that's kind of interesting is that in um, areas like this, uh, growth rings will often be thick and thin based on different seasons. Whereas uh, near the tropics where there's no seasonality because they're like right there, um, or there isn't the same seasonality, I guess I would say, oftentimes the rings are always the same size because they're not experiencing the same sort of seasons that we are, which I always think is kind of cool. But so this is really what they're talking about when they're talking about heartwood. And this is another one that when we talk about pruning, we're gonna talk about what do you need to do to basically protect the heartwood? Because again, this is dead tissue, right? And it's gonna be really open to disease and decay. So what happens when a tree is injured, right? Think about it, right? A tree is essentially a long tube, <laughs> right? So basically what's happening is that you have all of this vascular tissue, all this cambium tissue around the outside, moving sugars and uh, water up and down. And so if it's moving up and down, right? And that's the whole point there. It means that if a pathogen were to get in, if a disease were to get in, right? It moves up and down really quickly, right? Because like, that's the whole thing that that thing is set up to do is it's set to move quickly. And so a tree has to have a way to basically shut down movement, right? So that it can't just kind of zip to the roots and to the shoes. And so for trees, it's um, called compartmentalization of decay. Uh, if you wanna like impress your arborist friends, it's compartmentalization of decay in trees or code it. Uh, but it's really helpful for just thinking about how that actually happens. So imagine, right, you have this tree over here and basically this is a site of an injury, right? Injury comes in, so it's a you know kid whacking it real hard with a stick, you accidentally hit it with the weed whacker, whatever might happen here. So the first thing the tree does is it creates a wall above and below, and that's to stop that really fast movement, right? It's just trying to stop the pathogen. Um, it's kind of cool, the way it happens is actually because it's when air gets into that portion, it like clogs it up. The tree then creates another barrier so it doesn't get into the heartwood, right? So the tree seals off basically toward the center because it doesn't want it to move inward. Then because we're actually thinking in 3D, the tree starts sealing off so that it can't move laterally either, right? And so what I mean by that is like, if this is the branch, right? The tree actually also has to make sure it doesn't move left or right. So it has to create walls there. And then finally, the final part that the tree seals is on the outside, it seals by basically forming a new scab callus coating right over it. And when you look at trees that have been damaged in their past, it's really, really obvious that this has happened, right? So these are those lateral walls that are, have been created. This is kind of where the interior wall is, right? Or the this is like the ceiling over wall. This is where the damage was, right? Like those are really clear lines where there was damage. And the tree was basically able to hold the disease and the decay in kind of a like stagnant place. And different trees are able to do this kind of with different ability. So like some trees are really good at doing it and some trees are really not good at doing it, right? And there are lists where you can just look up like how well does this tree compartmentalize? Which is helpful for when you're pruning because you'll know basically how well it responds. And so the way to remember this is really people heal trees seal, right? So a tree will never heal a wound the way you or I would by adding new tissue there. It will just like try to cover it over, right? Because that's really the best it can do is it can cover it over and try to create barriers on the other side. A little bit more on tree anatomy 101 is roots. So it's really helpful to think about a tree as basically being like a wine cup on a dinner plate. Right, so it's shaped like this and then it goes on to a big thing outwards. So like this tree's roots would actually even go out much further to the left and to the right. The majority and most important of the tree's roots are the absorbing roots. They are in the top 12 inches of soil. They are the ones that are taking up nutrients. They are the ones that are kind of really interacting with the soil biology. You also have later, lateral roots. Those are a little bit thicker. They kind of help anchor the tree in place, right? Anytime you've ever seen a tree blow over, you know, it's got that big mass of soil that comes out with it. Those are really the lateral roots pulling up. And finally, the sinker roots. And sometimes you'll hear these called anchor roots. Um, 
but it's basically the idea of these roots that are actually going down into the ground. And for the most part, they actually really don't go very deep, right? Again, like wine cup, wine cup on a dinner plate, right? So this thing is all basically up in the top. And it's why trees can be really easily impacted by things like construction and everything else like that, where they're causing compaction or where you're messing up the roots. Uh, this is a great picture I love where it shows, right? So these are the anchor roots or the sinker roots. And you can see even this car and the curb being here, right? The roots are not gonna go any further because there's no nutrients or anything available for them under the asphalt. And so you basically really cut the whole root area on that whole side, right? So that tree wanted to go out probably to like over here and it wasn't able to, right? So now it's gotta rely on everything else over here. This was something I saw when I was out walking the other day is that these folks are, I'm not 100% sure what they're doing, but I think that what they're trying to do is they were trying to remove all their turf probably to try and like add like native beds, which is really great. Um, but what they did was they went through and they tilled all of this. And so I'm gonna be watching these trees this summer to know kind of how that works out, right? Because if those absorbing roots are in the top 12 inches and they tilled down four to six inches and we get a hot snap, we're just gonna see how those trees do. Maybe they'll be great. I am hopeful for them, but right. So this is the sort of problem you can cause when you get too near tree roots. And a tree's roots don't just extend out as far as the canopy extends, right? That is kind of an old wives tale. They'll extend out two, three times as wide as the canopy, right? They go out really far. Tree roots are actually even more impressive than that. If you guys have seen these talks, you know I love talking about mycorrhizal relationships. I think they're so cool. So these are fungal relationships that extend the reach of the tree root. So they go even further than you would think. So basically you have all these special um, mushrooms and fungi and what they do is they provide uh, all these resources to the tree, basically help them with nutrient and mineral uptake. And the tree gives them those sugars it's worked so hard to make in return. Uh, so this is a great picture of a pine seedling where like the actual pine seedling roots go about this far and all of the rest of this is just the fungal relationship reaching out, kind of helping it go even further. There's a lot of research coming out now showing that in forests, these fungal relationships actually like even start diving into each other across trees, which is really cool, creating this whole like super connected network all through the forest floor. So all the trees are sharing resources, they're stealing resources, they're sending each other signals. Um, I think this is just like super amazing and like some of the coolest research that's going on right now. You can see these guys are connected. So these relationships are super important. And as we think about soil and healthy soil, right, this is what you're getting with healthy soils. You're getting the ability to have these really interesting fungal relationships that really support the health of the tree. So what do trees need? Almost all trees want even water. They really like even water. They don't need big shocks low sunlight exposure for the soil, ample space above and below ground. Remember this guy goes way further below ground than we might think. High biological activity in the soil and moderate organic content. And so if you will imagine, right, what I just told you, like four of the five are about soil, right? So step back, we're gonna take a minute, we're gonna talk about the soil because we have to talk about soil. I think that next time's entomology talk might be the only time we don't talk about soil, but every other time we need to talk about soil because that's actually what we're talking about with almost all plants. So a little bit of a primer on soil. It's like one of my favorite diagrams, I just love it. Um, <laughs> so a good soil is made up of space and stuff, right? So space is this space between the soil aggregates, the soil particles, and the stuff is the stuff actually in the soil, the different minerals and um, rock elements and everything else like that, right? So you need both of those. The tree needs basically the space to be able to get water, to be able to take up nutrients, which are actually in that water. And it needs the stuff because that's where the nutrients come from, right? They come from the stuff, move into the water, and that's how the tree takes it up. Soil has a number of different properties that are very important. Uh, it has physical, chemical, and biological properties, all of which are very, very important for trees. Um, I will send a link to the recording of our soil talk in case you like want to do the deep dive. If you don't want to do that, the real take home and the real thing to think about in the very beginning is just what makes an ideal soil, right? So an ideal soil from a tree's perspective and from most plants' perspective is typically about 50% space and 50% stuff. Right, so you want about 50% space and for that space you want about half of it to be full of air and half of it full of water. And for the stuff you want about 45% mineral content, so this is like from the bedrock from the parent material so from what is making that soil 
and you want about 5% organic content. And so that's things like compost and rotting leaves and just decaying stuff, right? It's like the thing, stuff we think of as making soil really good, right? This is kind of interesting because a lot of people are like, compost is the best ever. And I'm like, compost is the best ever if it's with a lot of really good mineral content. Lucky for us, that's probably the only time you'll hear anyone say it that way. But lucky for us here in the Piedmont, we have amazing clay. And so actually it's really, really good stuff. It just needs a little bit of organic matter, about 5% mixed in to make it really kind of form up right. But it holds nutrients really well. Um, and it's actually really good stuff. It just needs that organic content to kind of make it form right and do a good soil. So for mineral particle sizes, uh, the major ones that we think about are sand, silt, and clay. So these are their relative sizes to each other. So all soil, the mineral content is either a size sand, silt, or clay. Sand you can think of as being like the size of a basketball. Silt you can think of as being like a tennis ball, but not fuzzy. And clay you can think of as being like a grain of rice, right? So it's tiny, it's flat, it holds water. Imagine pouring water through a bucket of basketballs versus pouring water through a bucket of rice, right? Like we have all <laughs> looked at our soil and gone like, why is it still waterlogged, right? It's because the water just can't move through it properly. On a sort of really micro level, right? This is a picture of sand that was just taken with basically a normal lens. This is a picture of clay particles that had to be taken with a um, microscope, right? And you can see that these are almost like shaped like little decks, like pieces of card, right? Where they are gonna stack up right tight on each other. Whereas the water is gonna pour through this really easily. And so for the most part, most people in this area, you're gonna be dealing with clay. There are some like folks out there who are dealing with sand just because of the history of the area, but most of us are dealing with clay. And you're like, okay, it gets waterlogged. I feel like it gets really dense. Like it gets really hard to work with. Ashley, what are you talking about when you're like sand, clay is actually great. Clay holds nutrients super well and just needs a little bit of organic matter to really make it sing. So the reason that that is true is because organic matter helps soil structure. Soil is how the mineral elements that we were talking about actually form up into clumps, right? So it's not like you actually just have them and they're like laid out perfectly on a table, right? They all clump up and this is what gets it to do it, right? Is the organic matter. So more organic matter leads to better structure. So you have less compaction, better water infiltration. So the water goes into the soil better and it moves through the soil better and also improve nutrient availability. So that all the amazing nutrients we have with our clay, organic matter makes it even better. As your soil gets healthier and healthier and healthier because you're adding organic matter, more organisms will come. So the fungi that were a part of those mycorrhizal relationships, the worms that create um, air pockets, so the sort of space in the soil. Many organisms will help plant growth, growth and further improve soil structure. And soil has a very complex food web. So it's not like you're just going to be attracting all the bad guys or all the good guys. You're going to be attracting all of them but they will balance each other out, which is really, really cool. The other thing that we can work on as gardeners that's really, really helpful is that by keeping living, growing roots in the soil, we actually help those clumps form even better. So this is a great picture I love where this is a, um, it's a clump of soil, it's called a soil aggregate, but it's a clump of soil that's really well formed and it's like the good stuff, you know, it's like holding together just right, it's super healthy, super nutritious, and if you take a little picture and you zoom in on it, what you'll see is that there's roots growing through it, there's fungi growing through it, there's spores, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. And a huge part of that is how those living roots actually help stick together all those different things. So this is all kind of, as you would expect, a really complex interrelated web where you want organic matter, you want living organisms, you know, plants and animals, you want good soil to start, which we have, and all that comes together and the soil gets even better, right? Like it is more than the sum of its parts. So I think that's super, super cool. It's something that trees can always absolutely help with, especially with all those little fine feeder roots, right? They will help make the soil better and in turn they will grow better because of that, right? So they will be kind of start this positive feedback loop, which is super cool. One thing we do need to be aware of with our soil here, even as we add organic content, is that soil pH really affects nutrient availability. So this is a um, figure and it shows some of the major plant nutrients and wherever it's green, it means that that nutrient is very available. Where it's yellow, it means it's not as available and where it's red, it means it's unavailable basically. And this is really interesting because what it shows is that there is this band actually right around here, 6.5, 6 where most of the nutrients are like 
more or less available, right? Some things aren't perfect, right? Calcium and magnesium are not perfect, but you basically can capture most of these guys and you can capture most of these guys. Outside of this range, there will be a number of these nutrients like these, where what's happening is that it doesn't matter how much of that nutrient you add to the soil, the plant can't see it, right? It is not available to the plant because your pH isn't right. So here in the Piedmont, our native pH is a little bit lower than this, just because of our clays, what they're doing and how they're acting. And so this is a lot of times we like to do soil tests, we like to do lime to try and get our pH up. One thing that's really helpful though, is if you are focused on trees and if you are really interested in planting native trees, native trees often handle slightly acidic soil better, right? So they will handle somewhere down here better than a lot of other plants would, right? Because they're adapted to it. They evolved here. They have dealt with these soils for so long that they basically know how to squeeze every last little nutrient out, even when other plants might have a hard time. It's another argument really for planting native trees when possible. There's a lot of other reasons, but one of the reasons is that because often they will be better adapted to the actual soil conditions and they'll be able to better tolerate them. I love this picture. I, I like that flickers are, um, this bird is called a flicker. Flickers are woodpeckers but you will routinely see them on the ground with robins in the winter because it's like they forgot that they were woodpeckers, which I find really delightful. So we're gonna talk a little bit about finding the right tree for the right place. So there are a couple of major things you're gonna to wanna to consider when you think about picking a tree and picking a place. And I would argue that in, for most people, right, you don't have a tree and then you need to find a place or you have a place and you need to find a tree. We're kind of meeting in the middle for most of us, right? Like we have a tree we kind of like, we have a site where we kind of need a tree, right? And we're gonna try and figure out how to make them work together. But the major things to consider are, what is the goal of the tree? So is it shade, privacy, beauty? Is it something else entirely? What's the site like in terms of available soil, water, and light? How big will the tree get, right? above and below ground, right? Remember our picture of those roots going out so far, right? We need to think both above and below ground. And then finally, considering other benefits. So flowers, bark, fall color, any of these different things that we like, just a certain form of a tree that you might especially like, right? These are all things that you kind of need to work through so that you make sure you're finding the right tree for the right place. Thinking about your site, there's space considerations, right? Power lines, buildings, soil volume. So this is construction that was taking place near my house. I took this picture actually for my soil talk, although I didn't get to use it because I was like, that is the clearest picture of red clay <laughs> I've ever seen and compaction, right? There was heavy machinery moving in and out. And I walked by the other day and they had planted these two red maples in what is sometimes affectionately referred to as the hell strip, this spot right here. And I'm thinking about the root volume on these trees. I don't know, right? Well, this is another instance where we're gonna see how it goes, right? Because maybe this was not actually the absolute best spot for a tree, but I assume they were actually required to plant these here by city code. So we'll see how it works out. Sunlight, so varying intensities, right? So a lot of times the Southern light is the most direct exposure. Western light is going to be hot in the afternoons. Eastern light is a little bit more gentle and kind of kind of a cool morning light. And finally, a northern exposure is going to typically have almost a shady condition. And remember that light changes throughout the year. For deciduous trees, so trees that don't have their leaves in the winter, maybe that's not as big of a deal, but just be aware of the fact that the sun, the angle of the sun changes throughout the year and there might be places that are in shade in the winter that are sunny in the summer. Soil quality, so amount of compaction, amount of organic matter, right? So this is low organic matter, high compaction. That's a really hard way to be a tree actually. And finally heat sinks. So this is something, especially in urban areas, these pavement areas, these kind of impervious areas are all gonna serve as heat sinks. They're gonna take up a lot of heat. They're gonna hold that heat. And that's gonna be really hard on these tree roots, right? And so there are definitely trees that can handle that and that can take that, but it's kind of like um, they survive it right? There are trees that can survive it and there are trees that can't survive it. Um, it will be a little bit hard on all of them though. So thinking about what you can and you can't change about your site. So some of the uh, hardest things to change, so way down here are going to be things like water, soil type, and heat sinks, right? 
I would argue that water is actually pretty hard to change long term. So basically any tree you plant, it's going to take about five years for it to get really established. You're going to have to water it during that period. But imagine, right, that I'm implanting a tree that might last two or 300 years. I cannot provide water for two or 300 years. Like I can set it up right and hope for the best, right? But like that tree is going to beat me in terms of lifespan, right? So water can actually be pretty hard to change. This is some of our great North Carolina red clay. This is our our soil actually, that's going to be really hard to change. Soil pH is also very hard to change. When we think about um, perennials, when we think about shorter lived plants, we often can add lime, we do our soil test, we do a good job. If our soil is too acidic or too basic, we would add sulfur. But again, if you're thinking about something that's going to grow hundreds of years, right? Like I can't guarantee you're going to get lime in a hundred years. I can't do it, right? So this is a picture of a pin oak that I grew up with. Um, I grew up in Indiana where the soil was much more basic. So uh, the pH was higher. This pin oak wanted a lower pH, like it would have been much happier here. And so because again, pH affects nutrient availability, this pin oak couldn't take up iron properly. And so every couple of years, my dad would go out and he would pound iron tablets into it and it would grow. And finally he lost the fight. You know, we had a neighbor who would lower their pH with a big bag of sulfur in the spring and a big bag of sulfur in the fall. And that's going to work really well until Mr. Prince is not around to do those big bags of sulfur, right? So it would be better to pick a tree that was the pH, that wanted the pH that your soil naturally is, right? Otherwise, you're going to end up getting yourself into kind of a headache and you're going to have to be doing this ongoing maintenance. Soil biology is actually a little bit easier to change as your soil gets healthier, um, as it gets kind of more organic matter, as it's shaded more, right? It can really start to improve. If you build a better soil, the critters will come. Organic matter is really one of the first steps for that, right? You can add in compost, you can add mulch, you can take care of all of those things and build up organic matter over time. That's actually very doable. And finally, compaction. Right, compaction is going to be one of the easier things to fix. Although again, you got to do it before you plant that tree, right? You can't do all your tilling after the fact, otherwise we're going to run into that situation, right? Where you've just destroyed all of those absorbing roots. So for compaction, it's absolutely worth thinking about trying to fix this before you plant your tree. Taking a tiller and breaking up the top six inches to I would argue even as far down as a foot, two feet of compacted soil right where your planting area is. You know, obviously those roots are gonna go out wide. So I would go as wide as I kind of had the patience for, if not a little bit wider. Careful with tilling because it can disturb the soil biome. So the critters, creepies and crawlies in the soil and it can lead to organic matter loss. So just do it the once, do it sparingly and it should be totally fine. And then avoid tilling when it's overly wet or overly dry, just because you can lead to actually like more weird compaction problems if you do that. But if you kind of just go ahead and till right before you start, not after planting, you till before you plant, you should be good to go, right? And it can really help your plant and help it set it up for success. So thinking about types of trees you might choose, there are kind of a couple major categories of trees. The first would be shrub-like, these are multi-stem, typically less than 15 feet tall, um, but they're wide, right? They're going like, to send out suckers. They're going to keep going. They're going to have multi multiple stems. They're going to be kind of wild looking. These are some really fun ones that often have really cool flowers, fruits, nuts, berries, right? So you have things like witch hazel, which is just an awesome plant. It blooms um, like late winter. So it blooms right and is wild and like Dr. Susie looking, right? When you really want something kind of crazy. Uh, you also have uh, fringe trees, service berry, sumac. So this is uh, staghorn sumac, which I think is absolutely, this is the plant I was talking about at the beginning. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Staghorn sumac has these great berries and it can have really wild red fall color. It's absolutely gorgeous. Hazelnut, these are the hazelnut flowers, which I just think are so pretty. Um, this is a service berry. Service berry is uh, really cool. It's got berries that the birds just absolutely love. Super, super tasty. There are also the small maturing trees. These are kind of like shrub-like trees, but they tend to have slightly fewer stems, right? Like they tend to be a little bit more well-behaved. Um, they're a little bit more upright. So this will be things like redbud, dogwood, which is our state tree. Um, there are a couple different species of dogwood. There is um, Cornus florida, which is our state tree. There's Cornus natale, which is a Western dogwood. There's Cornus cusa, which is a Chinese or Korean dogwood. I forget which one it is. They're all beautiful. They're all interesting. Uh, Japanese maple, 
classic. There's a million different Japanese maples if that's what you're into. Uh, Star Magnolia has these beautiful blooms. American smoke tree, which just looks wild, right? This is that kind of like flowering structure on the American smoke tree. And I just think it's like just wild looking crazy. And also a lot of dwarf and weeping varieties. So one of the real um, popular ones around here is this Ruby Falls red bud. This is a red uh, weeping purple red bud that was developed actually at NC State. And kind of a cool thing about a lot of weeping varieties is that they like, I don't know how to explain this, they naturally want to weep, but you can force them up, right? So if the tree is allowed to start like weeping, right, at a foot above the ground, it will always stay, right? Because the cells don't move, that's as tall as it will get and it'll just weep and go out and out and out. Whereas if instead you kept propping it up until it was maybe six feet above the ground, right? You like forced it while it was growing to go higher, like this one, it would start weeping at six feet and it would come back down, right? So you can actually kind of control the point where that happens by just basically staking it up as high as you want and not allowing it to weep. And then it will almost like solidify itself with that secondary growth and it will start weeping from that point. So there's all sorts of different ways to do this that are really cool. I've seen some amazing weeping red buds where they're over retaining wolves, which is just beautiful. Some medium maturing trees for the area. So these are gonna be 15 to 60 feet tall at maturity, often have a nice rounded form. Um, the height can be pretty responsive to site conditions. So if they're happy and they're good and they're like having a good time, right? You're gonna get a big guy. And if they're stressed, they might stay a little bit smaller. If they have a smaller root zone, they're gonna stay smaller. So then it's gonna be things like maples, elms. Um, I love this winged elm because it's got these really crazy like structures coming out of all the branches. You'll look up into a winged elm and you'll see this like <laughs> crazy winged structure on all the branches. Um, elms, willows, uh, pawpaw. So this is the flower of the pawpaw. Pawpaws, if you've never had one, are the craziest fruit ever. They are not really commercially viable because they like don't stay good for any time at all. But if you find a pawpaw, they're so soft, you can eat them with a spoon. They're absolutely delicious and they're almost tropical tasting. They're really, really cool. And they tolerate a little bit of shade and they tolerate being wet, um, having wet feet. So that's kind of a pretty special tree around here. Uh, honey or black locust. So these are ones that can be really, really nice because they can provide really good shade, have a really good spread on them. And finally, river birch, which is like kind of the like poster child for beautiful bark, right? Beautiful exfoliating bark. So these are all really nice trees that kind of provide all sorts of different amazing benefits. And that takes us right up through the large maturing trees. So these are the big guys, big over 60 feet tall, biggest, but also best benefits, right? These are the ones that are gonna support a tremendous amount of wildlife. They are gonna support pollinators, the birds, everything basically. They're really those keystone species. So we have everything from tulip poplar, which the tulip poplar blossoms have been dropping recently. And every time I see them, I think that they just look crazy. This is a crazy color scheme for a flower and they look primitive and I just love them. They're so wild. Um, they're just so wild. You also have oaks, um, a food source for so many things right here. This little acorn, right? This is like what powers the forest around here, right? This is what keeps it all going. Uh, you have American beech, which has beautiful, beautiful, smooth, silvery bark, uh, catalpa, which I think these look like tropical, crazy plants too, because their leaves are just, I mean, their leaves are huge. And then you have these hanging um, like bean structures, right? Those are the seed pods basically. So these look really wild. Pecan, who doesn't like a pecan? Delicious. Um, and bald cypress again, right? With these crazy knobbly knees. So these are gonna be the ones that are big investments space-wise. They're gonna take a lot, but they're gonna give you the most. They're really gonna be spectacular. And if you can have space for them, if you can make space for them, it's absolutely worth it. So with that, I am going to propose that we take just a little short break, maybe seven minutes to get us to 7 p.m. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna dive into planting 101. So I'm gonna look through the questions now, and then I am going to, let's take, Couple minutes, everyone go to the bathroom. Don't worry, I'm not gonna answer any questions while you're gone. And then we'll start answering questions if that works for everyone. I'm sure that'll be fine with everyone. We only have a couple of questions that, um, that um, so far, this is, um, one is, so we're, we've received um, all the information you've given us so far, but Robert, Bob is interested in how to care for the trees in your backyard. You know, like what can you do for them? 
And then um, the other question was regarding, Jane wants to know how pH affects the growth of uh, mycorrhizae, which help the trees with their uh, potassium and magnesium. But um, I know that mycorrhizal growth happens at all pH ranges, but thought perhaps you might wanna expand on that when everybody gets back. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> of course, like Jane, like throws me the one that I'm like, what is happening? Um, and Sarah, I will. Um... Sarah, that is a great question. <laughs> um, because you're not you're layering the entire around the entire tree. Uh, you know, you're just doing a. Um, a well, a you would, you would, but you would around a branch. So, hey, Sarah, you're the propagation specialist. How exactly does one air layer? Let's see if we can riddle this one out from the other direction. You know, maybe we can come up with the answer. All right. So you make a uh, one inch cut around the tree. One in, take one inch strip of, of the bark away from the tree. And then you put your rooting hormone on it and you pack it with oh. sphagnum moss and then wrap it tightly. But I've always I, wondered how you could girdle a tree and kill it by taking that one inch bark ring off of it, but you don't kill it when you do, of course, you're working on a branch and not the trunk, the main trunk for one. There you go. Yeah, but, but even like, Sarah, I think that like, so if we think through what you're saying, this is my impulse. You should like see my process. Um, so if you think about doing a cutting, right? A cutting is actually just as brutal, if not more so, right? Where you're detaching everything and then you're trying to get that rooting hormone up on the growth, the nodes, so the growth tissue. So you're basically trying to cut down to the cambium to expose it to that rooting hormone. But if you're, I, I'm like, sorry, I'm curious too how far down you cut because if you cut the bark down to the cambium, if you lift the bark, but actually leave the cambium intact, you would just be exposing it to rooting hormone, but you wouldn't be cutting the connection. Whereas if you go through the cambium, then you're almost like doing a cutting, but leaving it in place. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's a mystery to me. I'm just not sure how, because some people say go down to the cambium layer and then scrape that and scratch it up to break it up. And I'm People I think, but that must be why you have to keep it moist and why you have to do all that wrapping. You know what I mean? Because it's the it same is, idea. It is pretty protected after you get finished putting all that sphagnum moss on it. Yeah. And sphagnum holds like, what, like 17 times its weight or something crazy in water. Yeah. Um, it's a mystery. I've always wondered about that. I, I, cause I've killed a tree girdling it before doing that, you know, maybe it's because it doesn't get, allow the cambium to dry out if you put that moisture around it. That's what I think it is, is I think you're almost like doing a cutting in place. Yeah. In some ways, right? It's also, there's a, there's a small amount of living tissue. So the phloems toward the outside, I'm probably right. The xylems toward the inside. So if you cut through one of those transport vessels, but you cut the cambium and you don't cut through the other one, you have minor transport going on still. Right, so it's like, um, remember when we were doing tomato grafting and it was like, there was that crazy graft where you could like leave the plant top on or like how we did our ginkgos. Yeah, that's true. And if you if the xylem was left in place, then it would still be absorbing water, just like okay. it does. Yeah, uh, the mineral, the, the xylem I think is on the outside and that's how everything goes up. The phloem is inside oh. in the canyon. Oh. But either way, you still have like minor transport going on, right? Where it's like some amount of resources are being transported through the plant enough that if it can just like get its act together <laughs> and start forming roots, it'll survive, right? I mean, that's the whole, that's my like brutal way of thinking about propagation, right? Is you were telling a plant that it has to get its act together. Otherwise, <laughs> like it's not happening. <laughs> I think it, I think it merits more research. Maybe I'll, I'll yeah. do we're digging on that one. <laughs> totally fair. Um, um, so we just got a third question in about um, spraying around tree roots. So we'll get to that one before you move into the next section, Ashley, if that's all right with you on making an, a note. Yeah, that, yeah, I can totally do that. So, um, and Jane, just about the, the phosphorus and the magnesium, um, 
Don't answer that question. What? No, it's yeah. already answered. You have to ask for everybody. You have to wait for everybody to get back. Oh, sorry, I get like yeah, I get so excited. <laughs> sorry, you guys. <laughs> it's six fifty nine. It's so close. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm doing it. I'm diving in. <laughs> Jane, um, All right. So, um, I bet there's an optimal range for pH for trees. I don't know an exact answer to your question, but my assumption is there's an optimal range for pH for, for those mycorrhizae. And if you're outside of it too far, it's going to be problematic. But if you think about the relationships between fungal mycorrhizae and their hosts, so the trees they live on, those are very tightly co-evolved relationships. So if you are in a soil that is going to support the tree, it's probably going to support the mycorrhizae as well. But if it's the wrong pH, I wouldn't be surprised if the mycorrhizae are not enough to help you overcome that because they can't uptake nutrients either because they're not doing particularly well, if that makes sense. Um, is that like vaguely satisfying? Um, yeah. Interestingly enough, there are some plants that don't form mycorrhizal relationships at all, which is like really weird and you feel like they're kind of missing the point. But what? Brassicas don't. Um, so things like the mustards and um, rape seeds and broccoli and cabbage and don't, don't form mycorrhizal relationships. Wow. Yeah. yeah. They're just like, they're going it alone. They're, they're, <laughs> oh dear. They're, they're decided they want to be by themselves. <laughs> um, so if you spray Roundup or other chemicals around a tree, how does it affect the tree? So that really, really depends on the chemical you're spraying. So things like Roundup, um, I would not douse the soil by any means, but one of the really amazing things about the active ingredient in Roundup, which is called glyphosate, is that glyphosate gets bound up to clay and organic matter particles very, very tightly. It gets bound up so tightly that it's inaccessible by any, like by roots or anything else like that. And it breaks down basically before it can become unbound. And so what that means is that when the glyphosate hits the soil, it's basically um, can't be seen by the plant anymore. However, there are all sorts of other herbicides um, that don't have that action, like where they'll hit the soil and they're still obvious to the plants. And you will hear about like poorly instructed landscape crews killing trees because they were spraying the grass underneath, right? So it's one of those things where you just have to be really aware of what you're using and kind of the chemistry of the product you're using and how it works. And in general, I would probably stay away from like the prize trees on my property when I'm using things like that because I don't want to get it wrong, right? They're going to be somewhat resilient. It's going to be hard to kill them in one go, but um, why test fate if you're not sure how your product works, right? And you can always reach out to us and we can help work you through it too. Um, okay, so Bob wants to know about tree care in your backyard after it's, um, after it's established. Will you be addressing that in this next hour? Yes. So we'll be talking about planting and then we will be talking about pruning. Um, um, well, also what you can do for plant health, you know, this, this is not the forest floor and you want there to be something that adds organic material to that soil on an ongoing basis. Um, leaf mulch being my personal favorite. Um, all right. So you're getting, you'll get to that. Yeah. And Steve um, is building a house in Pisgah Forest and wants to know if we, uh, you know, uh, uh, it would an arborist help them figure out what to plant now? They've had to clear some trees to uh, to raise the house. Yeah. And he needs to take out some mountain laurel. And I'm sure there are plenty of arborists would be happy to take his money for that. <laughs> yeah. And we'll talk about how to find a good arborist and kind of what you're looking for in a good arborist. Um, I, a good arborist is like my best friend. Like I love a good arborist. Um, there are definitely some ways to find them. And I would say that when in doubt, call an arborist. Um, a lot of times they can come out and give estimates for free or for a pretty marginal amount. And they are really experts in this type of plant, right? It's kind of like one of those things where if you had a problem, if there was a specialist, why would you not call the specialist, right? <laughs> like I am not actually an arborist. I just really love trees. A real arborist would be able to provide you so much more context and nuance than I would. And it's just something that those folks are really worth their weight. So. All right, that's all of questions for this moment. Awesome. So, and I will um, kind of want to look up to that one question to make sure I see it. Okay. Cool. 
So I will, we're gonna dive right in. We're gonna talk about planting 101. And some of this is going to include um, sort of general tree care and general plant care. Um, so that will be covered here. So, you know your spot, you know your tree, you gotta actually find this tree, you gotta buy it, right? There are a couple of different major ways that you can purchase trees. There are bare root trees like we see here, container grown trees, and then what is called B&B &B or bald and burlap trees. And we're just gonna talk a little bit about the pros and cons of each way of buying a tree. So for bare root trees, some of the major pros for these guys are that they are ordered and shipped easily. They're often small. They're often sold as what is even called a whip. A whip is a tree that's like this big and got basically no branches, right? Like it looks like a little whip and it's got some little roots sticking off the end. They're pretty funny. Um, you can often get some really interesting varieties um, that are often less expensive than if they were bigger and that you can easily see and correct root issues. This is very, very common and very popular for fruit trees, especially. Um, where you can basically buy any sort of crazy fruit tree on any sort of crazy root stock that you might want um, and you can order them and, and you get them. And there are these really, really interesting, cool varieties that you would not be able to find at like Lowe's or big box store or X, whatever. Um, this is absolutely the way to do fruit trees for a lot of other trees. Um, it works pretty well. The city does a lot of planting this way because they like these trees. Um, they've started moving slightly more towards container trees, but these are really cheap for them to buy in bulk and they like them. And if some die, it's not a big deal, which brings us to the cons, right? So the roots are very easily damaged or dried out um, during shipment, during storage. The reason that this works, right, is because trees go dormant in the winter, at least deciduous trees do. So you can actually lift that thing up, clean off the roots, ship it, have it sitting in a warehouse, and it's fine until it starts breaking dormancy. But if it dries out too much or if anything else like that happens, that will kill it. And these also need extra care initially because if you right, remember what that picture looked like, right? It was like just sticks <laughs> poking out of the base of a tree, right? Those like sticky looking roots, right? So those don't have a lot of those absorbing roots that we talked about, right? These are very stripped down roots on small trees. And these guys are gonna need a little bit of care to get them started. Container grown is probably the most popular type of tree. That's probably what you're most familiar with. Um, some of the pros are that they have some of the absolute best selection locally, right? So this is where you are going to be able to find, um, go to a garden center, go to a big box store, and you're gonna be able to find a bunch of different interesting things and they're gonna be a nice size. Um, they're relatively hardy and can be planted almost any time. So um, it is really, really good to plant trees in the fall, if at all possible. Um, spring is kind of second best, fall is really first. But these container trees, right, whether it's sitting in this container or whether it's sitting in the ground, as long as it's getting water and as long as you're taking care of it, it doesn't really care, right? Like, <laughs> just water it, take care of it, and you can plant these basically any time of the year. They're also a reasonable weight. You will see the alternative to that when we talk about bald and burlap trees, but most of these guys you can pick up. One thing to be aware of with container grown trees is that you want one that still has some of these side branches on it when it's smaller. This guy here that's been pruned up so high, um, his, his trunk isn't really gonna develop quite as well as this one's well. These, these side branches help develop what's called trunk taper. They help kind of the overall architecture of the tree. So it's good not to prune it up um, too soon. One of the major cons is they can have really significant root defects. Um, and some of those you can correct during planting, but some of them are pretty brutal. So something you always wanna look at when you're buying these container grown trees is that if nobody's watching me, I have a tendency to try and really shake that thing almost out of the pot to see if I can see how root bound it is or how pot bound it is, you know, when those roots start circling. I like to look at the bottom of the pot. When these trees start growing out the bottom of the pot, attaching to the gravel everywhere else around them, like that's a bad sign, right? Those roots are really struggling. And what's actually going on there is that the roots are hitting the side of the pot and they're turning and they're continually turning in on themselves until you get root girdling. So this is a tree that was eventually killed by root girdling. See this branch? this root that reaches right around kind of like this, like hugs itself, right? This was probably a container grown tree. This was a um, defect basically that was not addressed at planting. Um, it might've been caused by the concrete, but I bet it was even sooner than that. And so this is something that we'll talk about how you fix this, but you just gotta be really careful with these container grown trees. Bald and burlap or B&B &B trees, they were pulled out of the ground and they're bald and burlap. Um, so the pro is that they are the largest trees available. I would actually say it's the con too, but they may have a better root structure. 
because what is happening with these trees is that they're being field grown and then they come, you pick out your tree and they like lift it out and they give it to you. And so what it means is that because it was field grown, the root structure all right up in here was never hitting a pot edge. And so those are good. But as you can imagine, right, this tree is this tall. We would have imagined it probably had a root system this wide, right? You're seeing where I'm going with this. That was all cut off. So even if the root structure is better closer, it's had a pretty extensive trauma. And that really brings us to the cons. Um, one is that this, this uh, soil root mass is very, very heavy. These trees can be five, six, seven, eight hundred pounds, right? You're not going to plant one of these yourself. You're going to hire a landscape crew. Um, they have a very extensive uh, root trauma that you have to overcome. They're going to require a lot of babying, a lot of watering. And what's really interesting about this is that in the time it takes them to overcome that root trauma, oftentimes that bare root or that container grown tree got its legs under it and started growing. So they will actually often reach a similar height to the bald and burlap tree by the time the bald and burlap tree has kind of the capacity to grow a lot more, right? So you're not buying time for yourself or buying size for yourself because that big tree is going to take so long to get established and that young tree is going to be a lot more resilient and is going to be able to catch up pretty quickly and it's a lot cheaper. So I, um, I can't personally for myself imagine a circumstance where I would get a bald and burlap tree, but I know some people like them, but I am just like not on that budget <laughs> either. So uh, this is something that uh, like the Duke's campus will do this a lot, but you know, this is kind of a, a bigger tier. So preparing for planting. These are those girdling roots from the pot. You can see where they're just twisting and twisting and twisting around. So the first thing you want to do is you want to remove all trash, all tags from the plant. You want to kind of open it up. If there's anything around the root structure, take all of that off. And then really most importantly, resolve root defects. So you're going to want to prune the girdling roots. Roots like this, if I was able to tease apart that root ball and start straightening them out, I would do that. And if I couldn't, I would cut them. That's a downside because I don't want to have to cut the roots, but it's better to cut them than to let them uh, basically choke the tree. Uh, you're going to want to open up the root ball. So if you have a container grown tree, what that means is it literally means you're basically like scratching the edge or scouring the edge as much as you can with your hands, with anything you have to literally try and start teasing the roots back out, right? And it can be a pretty laborious process. So um, the woman who used to be the director of Trees Durham, which is a local tree nonprofit, Katie Rose, she said it would often take her half an hour or more to get one of these trees really to the point where she felt like she had teased it open as much as she could. So it, it can take some time, but it's really worth the effort in the long run because you save those roots, you open it back up, um, and it's gonna really help with any sort of root structure defects. The other alternative, the more brutal alternative, but I have done this myself, is you take the shovel and you basically quarter the thing, right? So you take your big root ball, turn it on its side, and I take the shovel and I cut down hard at quarters, right? And that is to literally start cutting those roots. I lose a lot of root mass that way, but I cut them so that they can't keep girdling the same way and they will start flushing out more. Um, this is doing to a tree what you would do to a tomato plant, you know, where you open up that root ball. Um, and it's, it's brutal, but it is for the, uh, like, I guess, lazier and more violent among us. It is a satisfying way to do it. You also want to go through and prune any dead, dying, or broken branches from the top of the tree. There's no real reason to save them. They're just points where um, disease can get in, so just go ahead and take them out. So as far as planting your tree, if you only remember one thing, I want you to remember this, and that there is a hole twice as big as the root ball. Don't go deep, go wide. Spend your time going wide. Absolutely, because remember, again, wine cup on a dinner plate, right? Those, those roots aren't going down, they're going out. And that's where they really want nice opened up soil that you've kind of dug out and you've broken up the compaction. You also wanna score the sides of the hole. Um, because we have clay, it means that if you are, <laughs> if you just kind of, go straight down, you're going to actually make a clay pot, right? And it will fill with water and your little tree will drown. So you want to score the sides here so the water can all get it out. And you want the top of the root ball at grade or the trunk flare exposed. It's another way to think about it. So this area right here where the trunk flares out, every tree has this, you want that flare exposed. You do not want that buried. This right here is a stem. It's 
trunk that is meant to be exposed to air. It is not meant to be buried in soil. It's not meant to be buried in mulch. Like it doesn't appreciate it. It knows you're trying, but doesn't want that. So this should really be at grade. I like to have my root ball even almost like the tiniest bit above grade because then I'm sure it's not below grade, right? So if I have to make a choice, I would rather have the top of that root ball exposed like by an inch or two than to have it buried. Then you wanna go ahead and backfill this hole with native soil. You can add five to 10% compost if you want. The old guidance used to be that you would um, backfill with like 50% compost, 50% native soil. But what research has found is that what happens then is that when this soil in here is too nice, <laughs> the tree will like girdle itself, right? The tree will grow its little root out this way. It'll start hitting pure native soil and I'll be like, oh, that's not as nice. I don't want that. And it will start turning to keep in the nice soil. So you actually don't want to make that planting hole too nice, too hospitable to the tree because it will stay in it and it will girdle itself again. Trees are kind of divas that way. Um, you want to make sure this thing's straight from all directions. You don't typically need to stake trees. Um, again, as Katie Rose used to say, they don't run away. So for a lot of trees, uh, if they're planted correctly, if they're straight from all directions, that's enough. You don't need to stake them. They're really pretty resilient and they can hold up themselves. There are some circumstances where that might be different, but in general, I wouldn't worry about staking. And then for smaller maturing trees, you're gonna wanna really make sure you're orienting the branches as desired. So think about which way they're gonna grow, think about what they're gonna do. And that's because for those smaller maturing trees, a lot of times we leave lower branches. So those are branches that are actually gonna stay on the tree, right? So for our really big trees, right, are things like our oaks. The branches that are at your height when you plant that tree will eventually be pruned off, right? Remember, they don't go up with the tree. They always stay at the same height because plant cells don't move. So those branches are not permanent. So I wouldn't worry about it. But for our smaller trees, oftentimes they are permanent for things like Japanese maples and other highly ornamental trees. So just make you've got it, sure you've got it oriented kind of how you're liking it. And then really the single best thing you can do for a new tree, for an established tree, for any tree, is mulch. Don't forget the mulch. Um, this is really, really super helpful. There's some really interesting research that came out of Bartlett, which is a, um, it's a arborist company that also does a lot of really good research where they were showing that um, mulch helps, mulch instead of turf, right? Mulch instead of grass can improve tree root growth by like it was well over 50%. It might've been even close to 90%, but I don't wanna say that because I haven't checked that fact, but I know it was well over 50%. It was very, very impressive. Having mulch in that area instead of grass was amazing. And if you think about it, that makes total sense, right? Because grass is growing in the top four inches. The grass roots are growing in the top four to six inches of the soil, which is where all those absorbing roots are. So if the tree doesn't have to compete with that grass, it's so much happier. The mulch will also help keep roots cool in the summer. It adds organic matter to the soil as it breaks down, right? That organic matter will sink down in and it will percolate down into the clay and help it form better. Um, and Actually, it, a, a quick um, interjection here. Uh, how far around the tree? Yeah, great question. So this is a great diagram. This is, I would go even further, right? So they're showing you going at least out to the drip line. If you had the capacity to extend it even twice the drip line, the drip line is the outer edge. We like to think of it as like dripping, <laughs> like the outer edge. I don't know. That's what they call it. Um, this is, I would say is kind of like good twice as far is great, right? Because you know you have all those feeder, those absorbing roots out that far. And that's really where they need to be protected from um, competition. Not all of us can do that, especially on the biggest trees, right? It can be very difficult, but it's just kind of a thing, um, more is better, right? Like cut yourself some slack, but more is better, right? And the thing that's very, 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 very important about your mulch is like we talked about down here at the root flare, that is tissue that is evolved to be exposed to air. It is not tissue that is evolved to be underground and it doesn't wanna be underground. And it counts being surrounded by mulch as being underground. It is unhappy when that happens. You'll get these weird roots coming out. You'll get all sorts of, you can get rot, you can get other decay problems. So mulch, we like to say uh, it's a donut, not a volcano, right? So you don't go like this up to the trunk. You keep it out at least six inches from the trunk and further out. 
right? Don't have your mulch touching the trunk. Always have that um, root flare exposed. If nothing else, I just want you to take on the planting diagram and keeping your root flare exposed. But mulch is really one of the absolute best things you can do. And um, Monica, I know you said you have references on mulch. I tend to buy the same mulch just because I do. Mulch is good, right? I, I wouldn't get too much into the specifics of what you're using or not using as long as it's a natural product that's been aged and hasn't been dyed. It's good, like you were doing a good thing, right? No question. I just love using leaves that I gather from all over the neighborhood. I know my neighbors think there's something wrong with me. And I oh, use man, it's brown gold. <laughs> exactly. I use a, a, a leaf mulcher that is inexpensive. It's like a big string trimmer um, in the horizontal. And then you just drop the leaves through and the, the, it tears up all the leaves, makes them smaller. They stay in place. And then mulch goes on top of that just because I'm, yeah. I really think it's great stuff. Yeah, I actually, I got a, a secondhand one of those from someone and I like to think it's because I'm really hardcore. It's actually just because I don't have a garage. It's not living in one of our spare bedrooms. Someday though, it will have a better spot than in our spare bedroom, but I have a very tolerant people I live with. So no, those are really phenomenal. And I will say that um, just adding organic matter is always kind of um, order number one. Uh, you know, I, I said earlier when we were talking about the ideal soil, 5%, because of our climate, the warm temperatures and the, the abundant water in North Carolina, our soil uh, critters eat through organic matter very quickly. So you will have to continually be adding organic matter to reach a good level, right? So this isn't something you do once, it's something you're doing every year, right? Twice a year, you're mulching, you're keeping your soil covered and you're keeping it happy. Okay, if I, if I don't get to talk about this again, this is a picture from, um, it's called Plant Amnesty. If you're looking for one pruning book, uh, we had someone come and present to the Master Gardeners a couple of years ago now, who was like, if you only get one book, buy this book, and I bought it. Um, this is Cass Turnbull's Guide to Pruning. Cass Turnbull was the founder of Plant Amnesty. She has actually since passed, but this is a, a really phenomenal guide to pruning for trees, for shrubs, for anything you might be interested in. Um, she is all about, um, as she puts it, plant amnesty, right? So just not doing this to plants. Um, but I did think this was a great picture. So I will include a link to that in the email I send as a follow-up, but it, it's a really phenomenal guide to pruning. So for trees, there are a number of major reasons to prune. So first is to train young trees. So this is a young um, lace bark elm. It's a nice, beautiful, happy little tree, but actually there are already problems forming, right? There are multiple leaders forming. We'll talk about why that's a problem later on. But so even our young, ha happy, healthy trees really can take some correction early on. Um, and it's basically you're making cuts now so that you don't have to make bigger cuts later. Um, this was something that was very hard for me to understand, um, but it's, it's absolutely true. And we'll talk about why it's true in this section. Also to maintain plant health, manage growth and size. This is a major reason for pruning. Um, increase light under the canopy. I assume most of you are gardeners of other things, not just trees. And so you wanna make sure you do have some sunlight hitting, right? Improve safety, this is a major one. And also to improve ornamental aesthetics. So just sometimes you just prune because it you want it to look a certain way. And it's actually about this last point that I wanna take a minute to um, kind of put a like, not a disclaimer, but like a thought on this whole section. Different trees have different forms. It's just true, right? This is our big willow oak with this crazy like, right? It has one leader till here and then a major leader breaks off here and then it just like goes nuts, right? Right here, but that's a beautiful form and there's nothing growing around it really for the most part. Like it could harm a fence, but like those tree, those cars are actually pretty far away. So this is great, it's beautiful. It's a shade tree, it's wonderful. Um, similarly here, this tree exploded out um, right, Japanese maples that are going down to the ground, right? It's just well documented that trees have all these different natural forms. It is worth, when you are picking a tree, looking into what the ultimate form will be to make sure it's something that you're interested in. Um, there's some correction you can do, but think about why you're growing a tree, where you're growing it, what it could harm if a branch broke. Um, 
this is a little bit artistic, right? Like this is a little bit of you working with a plant so that you can kind of both be happy. Um, and not everything has to have this sort of really strong central leader we're about to talk about, right? Japanese maples are a great example. Red buds are a great example. Like I want a red bud with a fair bit of funk in its form, right? Like I want it to be weird. I want it to be sinuous. I want it to have multiple leaders. I, it's an ornamental tree. That's what I want. So what we're talking about when we talk about central leaders tends to be these very large trees um, that we need really good structure on to make sure they're safe. So just be aware of that. So pruning basics. First and foremost, limit pruning to a third of the canopy per year, less for mature trees. So this is one argument for pruning um, actually at the very beginning of spring when the tree is beginning to leaf out is that it means you can continually be stepping back to make sure you're never taking more than a third of the canopy out. It's actually really an okay time to prune. A lot of people like to prune late winter, but um, early spring is nice because it allows you to kind of make sure that you're calibrating right and the tree can still heal pretty well at that time. Minor pruning of dead or damaged branches can and should be done any time of year. Dead and dying branches are always just places where decay and other problems could seep in um, and you can always take them out, especially um, dying, disease, anything like that. Just take it out. Don't worry about it. It's better to take it out now than to wait for later. And major pruning again, typically done in late winter or early spring. The reason for that is because the tree is basically just coming out of dormancy. So we're talking about deciduous trees here. It's just coming out of dormancy. And so it's just getting kind of its vascular system working. It's getting everything flowing and it can heal really well at that point. Um, but it's not like the middle of the summer and oh my God, you just sheared off a third of my sugar production and I don't know what I'm doing, right? It's not a hundred degrees out and it has to cope with what you just did, right? So that kind of late winter, early spring is really the best time to do it. Some of the major tools you might use, bypass pruners. These are really useful for cutting small branches, small twigs. I'm gonna say specifically bypass pruners. <laughs> um, so these are pruners where you're gonna have two sharp edges bypassing each other. That is in contrast to anvil pruners, which will have one sharp edge and one flat edge. See, this is like, so instead of going like this, I'm going like this, this can lead to um, basically mashing and flattening and mangling, uh, and it's not nearly as good. So I would just stay away from those and I would really focus on the bypass pruners. Loppers, a good pair of loppers are just like fun to use because you can just kind of go around the yard lopping, which I really like. Um, this is a good pair. They are nice. They kind of give you a little bit more um, leverage, right? Like physics is your friend. I tend to be a person who buys small tools because I think like, I don't know, I like things that are small for some reason. Loppers, I always have to convince myself to get the longer and longer arm because I'm not as strong as some people. And so it's really nice to have that longer arm to kind of let physics work for you by having a better um, leverage. Handsaw is a really nice, fun tool, really, really useful. They can let you get through things that the loppers couldn't get through. Finally, a pole pruner. Um, I have this in parentheses because a pole pruner is like, I'm not gonna say it's varsity, it might maybe junior varsity, right? Like not everyone needs a pole pruner. Sometimes things that are that high, maybe you wanna think about an arborist, um, but a pole pruner can be pretty fun. A really good pole pruner will have um, a saw on one end and actually something that's more like a pruner on the other end that you like pull a string and it will prune at a height. And that's really nice. You will notice I do not have a chainsaw on my list. The reason for that is because for most homeowners, chainsaw shouldn't be used on the live wood. You might use it to cut up old dead wood, but for live wood, if it is of the caliber that it requires a chainsaw, it requires an arborist, right? That's just kind of a good rule of thumb is that like you probably don't need a chainsaw for live wood unless you really know what you're doing. I wouldn't do it myself. I would call an arborist. There are two major strategies for pruning. The first one is thinning. Thinning is where you cut branches back to the point of origin. This is a really nice, tidy way to prune because it's the least conspicuous pruning method, right? So you end up with something where it's um, not obvious necessarily where your cuts were. It's very clean, it's very nice. You don't have long bits just hanging out, cut edges looking weird, right? Thinning is the way to go for most things. It's even a good way to kind of reduce height often. Um, so for example, if this, this is a shrub, but imagine it were a tree, if it were too tall, I might just thin back 
the parts that were getting too tall, right? I would take them back just to where they actually directly connect. I don't typically like making pruning cuts so much of anything that doesn't go back to where it directly connects because it's just the tidiest way to prune and it looks the best. With trees, you wanna be really careful though. Too much thinning can lead to what's called lion tails, right? <laughs> so it's a long spindly thing with a tuft at the end. So this is what a lion tail would look like on a tree. The reason a lion tail is a problem on a tree is because it means that now all the weight on this branch is out here and this is actually really destabilized this whole branch. Um, so if you have done this to trees in the past, we have, for example, a crab apple right outside of our building at uh, Cooperative Extension that um, has some lion tails in it. So it has some areas where it was pruned too much along the branch. What will happen is for many trees, these branches will start sending up little sprouts called water sprouts. You will see like little branches trying to grow up. And basically over time, if you're patient, you can select certain ones of those to become new branches that will come off. And that can kind of help stabilize that whole branch and redistribute the weight in a way that's really helpful uh, just for the structure of the tree. But so just be careful, don't get too nuts when you're doing thinning, otherwise you're gonna end up with this problem. The alternative to thinning is really reduction. And so reduction cuts branches back to a lateral branch, right? So instead of going all the way back down here, you would have cut here, right? Um, rule of thirds again is very, very important. So cut back to a branch that is at least a third the diameter of the cut branch. So that sounds a little bit crazy, but so what do I mean? I mean that if this is my main branch and I've got you know a branch coming off of it, if what I wanna do is I wanna cut this part off like this, <laughs> this is fun, right? I wanna make sure that this lateral branch is at least a third the diameter of the one I'm cutting, right? Because otherwise what's gonna happen is that this is not gonna be big enough to support basically what's going on and just to, to kind of keep the tree structure moving right. This is typically much less desirable than thinning. Um, it's not ideal. Uh, some trees can handle it quite well, some can't. This goes back to this idea, right, of different trees are kind of, um, different species of trees are differently able to handle stress and to able to handle decay um, and compartmentalization. So this is one a species, I forget exactly what it was, I'm sorry for that, but it was quite able to seal this wound, right? So years later when it was cut open, you can see there's this decay here, but the decay doesn't go further. On other species of tree, you might see this decay going all the way down. Reduction is particularly problematic when there's a lot of heartwood, right? So this is a very big branch that you're cutting because remember that heartwood is dead and it can't protect itself from decay. So now you've exposed this whole dead portion to the elements, right? And so that's going to be a really, really easy place for disease and decay to get in. So um, this is why it's better to do more smaller cuts early than to rely on these bigger cuts later on, because then you're exposing larger areas to the environment, right? That just makes sense. It's always better to do your pruning early rather than later because the area exposed is smaller. So really it's all about pruning early to prevent problems later. So this is something that was very hard for me, I'll admit. Um, we tend to buy beautiful, healthy, young trees. We are very excited about them. We do not have the heart to kind of enforce a structure on them. I know I don't, I tend to be like, you're beautiful, do what you want. But if you imagine, right, many, many, many of our trees are actually very used to, they, they evolved to live in forests, right? They evolved to live around other trees. And so especially a lot of our deciduous trees what they will do is that the way they have evolved to grow is it's called um, a decurrent structure. It's this sort of structure here where it's kind of almost vase shaped and multi-stem, right? And the reason the tree does that is because all of those multiple leaders are racing up to the canopy, right? They are racing up to the top of the forest to try and get light because there's not a lot of light down where a little tree grows, right? The moment they hit light, Whichever one hits light first gets to take off, right? It becomes the leader. It just is the one that's gonna go straight up to the top of the forest canopy and it's gonna be happy and it will become the central leader. If that tree instead is living in an open lawn, there's no competition for sunlight, right? Every single one of those leaders can go nuts, right? Every single one of them can grow up. And so you'll get these things that basically explode out instead of having that one strong central leader. And it causes real structural problems for the tree. And so it's worth talking about what you do for a young tree to kind of enforce that strong central leader, especially if it's gonna be a big tree and it's a tree that you need to have a good strong structure. So first you wanna remove 
dead disease damage branches. That's pretty straightforward. You always wanna do that. And then you also wanna select and establish a desired structure. And we're gonna be talking specifically about central leaders. All right, so this is a good central leader structure. You wanna establish a lowest permanent branch. It's typically at least six feet high. I like to say it is, uh, take a lawn mo lawnmower under it high. You should obviously not have lawn next to your trees, which we just discussed, but like, let's be real, it might happen. And then you're also gonna to wanna to select scaffold branches for good spacing and attachment. And these are the scaffold branches, right? These major branches coming off that other things grow off of. And we'll talk about how you do all of this, right? So you're aiming to turn something like this into something like this, right? Because this is kind of the good strong structure. You would see if it grew in kind of ideal conditions that it was used to. So if you look at this tree here on the left, um, this is that Chinese elm that we talked about earlier. Um, this is the Chinese elm we talked about earlier. And so again, it's overall healthy. It's a cute little tree, it's doing great, but it has multiple leaders and the lowest branches can't stay. So the lowest branches you're gonna hang on to for a while as the tree grows up. But I will say that over time, you're gonna to wanna to be pruning them up. So again, zooming in on this central portion right here where you have basically all of these multiple leaders taking off, right? So this will become a leader eventually. You can see there's something tucked back in here that will become a leader eventually. All of these branches, right, are going to basically compete and um, cause problems for this trees down the, tree down the road. And really, if we wanna get down to the details of why multiple leaders are a problem. This is my favorite tree in my backyard. This is my silver maple. I love this tree. It has got three leaders. It is a hot mess of a tree, but I love it to death and I will defend it forever. So branches that are less than half the diameter of the trunk are better attached, right? So a branch like this, right? It's got a diameter of two inches. The trunk has a diameter of six inches. These are better attached. And the reason they're better attached is because they often have this area right here called the branch collar. This really forms when the diameter relationships are right. And the branch collar, so it won't form well over here. The branch collar is this kind of uh, magical area, like you will be able to see it. It literally looks like a little collar that basically can help suppress decay. It can help suppress uh, damage and disease from moving down. Like it is really well equipped to lose this branch at this point. And you're like, wait, why do I want it to lose the branch? No, no, no. You don't want it to lose the branch. You want it to be able to handle losing the branch though, right? If it can't even handle losing the branch, that's a real problem, right? Because that's how all that de death and disease gets back into the tree. The other thing I just wanna point out really quickly on this tree right here, and what will happen here is that this, um, I'm like pointing at my screen, like you can see it, you can't. Um, <laughs> so this five inch diameter branch right here and this six inch diameter trunk right here, they will both keep getting wider. Remember they have that um, mirror stem tissue, they're gonna keep widening out and eventually they're gonna bump into each other, right? So these guys are gonna bump into each other. These guys are gonna bump into each other. And basically they're gonna do that. And then the bark's gonna get all messed up between the two of them. They're not gonna grow, right? There's gonna be a real structural problem there. Um, and often it becomes a point where you can get disease moving in because it's just not strong, it's not healthy, it's not happy. So you don't want that happening. So going back to the branch bark, to the branch collar. So this area right here, this is gonna be where we start thinking about, um, we want branch collars because they will tell us where to prune. So this is a great picture from um, a awesome NC extension publication all about pruning. So this is something called a branch bark ridge like literally a ridge, right? Literally a ridge right here. It is on this one, here it is on this one. And then this branch collar is this slightly wider area right here. It's not quite as obvious on this picture, but you can still see how it widens out just a little bit right there as it comes down. And so if we were gonna make a cut, what we wanna do is we basically wanna cut just like that. We wanna cut so that we are um, not cutting straight up and down, but we're cutting like this. Where we're, so on this one, we would cut here right outside that branch bark collar or that branch collar right there because this whole area is really really well set up to close off to that sealing that we talked about earlier right trees don't heal they seal and so it can seal really really well right there and so by keeping a central leader you keep branch collars you keep the tree so that it is able to heal itself to seal itself properly rather it is able to stop decay from moving into the trunk is able to not have all of its kind of um, 
branches bumping into each other and causing all of these sort of friction points between the different barks, right? This is just kind of a great area. And so the easiest way to do that on a tree is really to do it when the tree is young. When the tree is young, it's not hard at all. It's something called branch subordination. That is a 10 cent word for a like two cent concept. This is amazing, right? This is very easy to do. So what you're doing is this is the one case in which a reduction cut is actually really, really useful, right? So that cut back to a lateral branch, not all the way back down. What you do is your goal is to say, okay, I have this point on the tree where I think it's forming multiple leaders. I only want one leader. So I'm gonna try and slow down the leaders I don't want so that the one I do want can grow better, right? I am just trying to shut down everybody I don't want <laughs> so, that, so that the winner can win, right? And I'm gonna pick the winner. So what you do is you cut a branch back about, you cut that undesired leader back about 50%. What that does is remember back from like tree biology, Slide number one, photosynthesis, right? All these leaves are producing sugars that are helping this thing grow. And so if you cut off half of a branch, it now has 50% less sugar to grow with, right? So it's gonna be really slowed down. Its growth is gonna really take a hit from that because it doesn't have all those sugars it was making previously, right? So you're just cutting off its food supply. So for example, on this tree right here, say I want this leader, I might make a cut right here. So I'm worried this is going to become another leader. So if I make a cut right here, cut back 50% to a lateral branch that's big enough, right? All of a sudden, this thing right here will really slow down in growth relative to this main leader. And the main leader will be able to get up higher and higher and higher and basically get to the point where this is no longer competition as a leader. So for the largest trees, for those really big oaks, for those sort of guys, it's really nice to actually maintain the central leader structure for up to 30 feet, right? Half the height of the tree, if it's even possible. That's where obviously you're gonna have an arborist, but it's just kind of a good goal to keep in mind. And so if you're like, this all sounds crazy, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around what you're telling me. This is a series of pictures that I love, even though they're obviously older, I think they're phenomenal. They're from- hey, Wait, uh, Ashley, if I could jump in for just a second, because I think this question is really pertinent for that last picture that you just had up. Flora wants to know if it's too late to prune. You know, you're talking about doing this thing in full leaf. I had thought that it was better to do it when the tree is do a little more dormant. You're still okay right now, actually. Okay. I wouldn't do, yeah, so yeah, it sounds crazy. <laughs> it sounds crazy. So late winter to early spring, right before the buds swell and break, the leaf buds, right? Right before the tiny leaves start emerging, right before the flowers start emerging, is a really, really good time to prune a tree, partially because you can see the whole structure of it, right? Like you can really see what's going on because all those leaves aren't in there. Right now, up until it gets a little bit warmer, so like I would do it this weekend, right? Like <laughs> I wouldn't wait any longer. <laughs> um, you can still prune because what's going on right now with the tree is that it's not super stressed by the weather yet, right? It's not July, it's not August. It's not just like the terrible weather we get, it's not. But all of that vascular tissue is really moving, right? So the water is moving, the sugar is moving, everything's moving. So the tree is in a really good spot to be able to seal itself. So for example, late fall or like early winter, like November, when the tree has dropped all of its leaves is actually not a good time to prune because even though you can see the whole structure, it's gonna be four or five months before the tree wakes back up. So it's just gonna be sitting there with all these little wounds drying out or being exposed to bad conditions for four or five months, right? Like you're trying to time this really like specific precarious time point where it's not that long until the tree is active or it's fully active, but you're also not immediately heading into super hot, super stressful weather, if that makes sense. So I, you can still prune right now. I would just like, I would do it now. <laughs> like I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait too much longer. I would do it now. Thank you. Yeah. On to my awesome fun. I think it's the University of Florida that put these out. I will send a link to this site. If you want to do a deep nerd dive into trees, this extension services website is phenomenal. <laughs> so this is a tree uh, where what's happening is it's, you know, it's an urban tree and there are two leaders, right? Very clearly coming off. And so it was decided that this 
this one here, because it's more upright, was the desired central leader. So what they did is they came in and they just whacked off that second one, right? They cut it back to this lateral branch that's at least a third in the size. And what they did is they took off all this sugar production up here, right? And it's amazing. Five years later, this is that cut, right? So just after five years, the second leader is just another branch, right? It is nothing special. It doesn't know, right? And this is because Again, plant cells don't move. So it got stuck where it was in place. It couldn't move up or down. And because it didn't have the sugars and the support and everything else it needed, it was just subordinated. That's what it's called, right? It was just turned into another branch and this central leader was maintained. And this is a much better structure than if it had become two leaders right here. So this really, really does work. Um, it's really effective. It's an easy way to do it. Again, do it when the plant is younger. You know, this is something to be out there every at very least two to three years, looking at your new tree, maybe for the first 10 years of its life, trying to catch these leaders and trying to force it up into one central leader. It's something that will really benefit you in the long run. And this little tiny cut right here could have been a much bigger cut down the road, right? Much harder for the tree to seal off, much more of a problem for it to deal with, but it didn't have to, which is really phenomenal. So, as far as selecting scaffolding branches, this is something we talked about kind of briefly. These are the permanent branches and you want them to be spaced both vertically and horizontally among the leader. So these are, you know, you might want about 18 inches in between them this way. You want them sort of radially, if you were to look down, you imagine them almost like spokes on a wheel, right? And so as you're pruning, just try to be selecting these and really your ideal branch attachment is about 45 angles or 45, it's 45 degrees. And so, um, this is like one of the problems that people have with Bradford pears, among the many problems with Bradford pears, is that they tend to have these really tight branch angles. And when you have really tight branch angles, um, they break very easily. And so the thing will just fall apart on you basically over time, especially in a strong wind. So something like a 45 degree angle is really the way to do it. Again, you can see in this picture here, here are your branch collars, right? You kind of know where you would cut if you had to cut on this thing. You're like, that's a lot of talk about cutting. How do I actually make a cut? Because it can be a little bit intimidating. You don't want to hurt your tree. Um, so locate the branch collar if it's present. It's that picture we saw earlier. So branch collars here. Um, branches that are greater than two inches in, in diameter um, require something called the three cut technique. And this is something you might have seen before, but it's really worth taking the time to do it properly. And what this means is that basically you cut up first. So here I would cut up, I would cut from below. And then I might cut out here to remove all this weight so I don't have to contend with it, right? So I cut up and that's to prevent bark tearing. I cut all the weight off and then I come back in and I do my third cut, which is really what I would consider my cleanup cut, right? So I do not start cutting at the branch collar. I start cutting out here and I work my way back in. And the reason that first cut, that upward cut is so important is because if you're not careful, what will happen is when this thing's branch is coming off, it will rip all the way down. And so here you were trying to be so good and so careful and cut at the branch collar so it could heal properly. And now you just have a massive gash on this thing, right? So it's better just to kind of make sure, take your time. Um, your third cut, your fourth cut sometimes is your cleanup cut, right? When in doubt, call the professionals. They really know what they're doing. They do a good job. Um, try to find a good arborist uh, can be hard, but there are a couple of easy tips. Uh, first off, you want to look for someone who is certified. This is certified with the International Society of Arboriculture, the ISA. Um, you can just straight up ask someone if they're ISA certified. There are different levels of ISA certification, but you just need an ISA certified arborist. These are folks who have taken the test. They receive ongoing education. They are, they've shown a clear commitment to being better, right? To knowing what they're doing. I like to call these people arborists, not tree cutters, right? Uh, you absolutely can ask if someone is insured and they should be insured. Ask for references and ask for a clear quote and contract for the work to be done. Um, these folks are professionals. They will behave professionally, right? Like they will do all of these things for you. They will be very helpful. Um, and one of the absolute great resources for finding um, an ISA certified arborist is a website conveniently named treesaregood.org. Uh, and this is where you can both find an arborist and verify a credential. So it's always helpful to start by asking around people who have had success with and all this other stuff, but just make sure they're certified, make sure they're insured, talk to them before you let them do the work, make sure you're feeling good about what they're saying to you. And it's totally fine to get multiple opinions. 
I just want to throw out a couple of resources real quick because we're nearing the end on resources for finding the right tree. You guys have all, if you've seen these talks before, you know I'm a huge fan of all of these resources. Um, a major one is the plant toolbox, which I'm actually going to walk through for a second at the end, just because I don't know if a lot of folks have actually really seen it yet in as much as I've just talked about it. Um, and then we also have the New Hope Audubon. This is our local chapter of the Audubon Society. They're all about birds, which means they're all about the environment. Um, so they have really great plant lists and also the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder. Um, the New Hope Audubon does the most amazing lists. I like go on and on and on about these lists, but it's because I love them so much in my heart. Like I think they're really phenomenal. Um, like gold star to whoever did this. So they can be overwhelming to look at, but I'm about to show you a tree version of the list. So for example, this is a New Hope Audubon list. Um, to all the trees, it's maples broken out by species, how big they get, how wide they get, whether they want sun or shade, how many number of caterpillars they support, whether they were an Audubon plant of the year, right? Like when they flower and fruit, right? Any sort of information you might possibly want about these trees. It is very, very easy to go through these lists and almost use them like um, shopping lists, right? They're all gonna be native. They're all gonna support wildlife. They're gonna do really amazing things. Many of them are very beautiful. They're hardy, they're great plants. Um, one of the things that I love that New Hope does is not only do they give you this big master list, but they actually then go through and give another version of the list that is organized by like supports the most wildlife. So trees are gonna knock everything else in your garden out of the water. Trees are gonna support the absolute most species. Um, so if you look over here, number of caterpillars supported by genus, caterpillars are like the basics or are, are like the base of like every yard's food chain. So if you support a lot of caterpillars, you support a lot of frogs and birds and everything else, right? Oaks are phenomenal. 488 species of caterpillars supported, which means way more than that species of animals supported. Um, black cherry, native plum, all of these are some of the highest numbers you will see of any plant you can possibly have in your garden, right? Like we said, these are the biggest bang for your buck. If you think about the massive push over the past however many years to plant milkweed because it supports monarchs, milkweed is phenomenal. I love monarchs, but that is one plant supporting one species. This is one plant, albeit a big plant, supporting 500 plus, right? Some of these don't have to be that big, right? So some of these, uh, like if we look at the dogwoods, 100 species and they're beautiful, right? So these are all really, really doable plants. Um, I would take a look at these, they're fascinating. I wanna take a second to uh, look at the plant toolbox really quickly. I'm just gonna pull, my, pull this up on my screen. Uh, it's like fun to try and figure out what you're doing. Does that look like the plant toolbox to you guys? I'm not hearing now. So I'll yes, see. ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. We all have to unmute ourselves. You're like, what am I doing? I'm just yelling yes, but I'm on mute. Um, okay. So the cool thing about the plant toolbox is that it is entirely developed um, by volunteers and staff for NC State. It is for North Carolina. It's really phenomenal. Uh, Durham County took a lot of the pictures. Woohoo! Um, so the cool thing here is the find a plant tool. So I just clicked here, find a plant, and I say I could look for any type of plant, but because this is what we're doing tonight. I am going to look for a tree. 899, that's too many trees. <laughs> so I would, I might say, okay, what are some things that I'm really interested in? Well, my landscape theme is native, right? So I want a native tree and I don't have that much light, which is kind of a bummer, but I have like two to six hours, right? So I'm gonna pick this one, 138. And I have, well, I'm in the Piedmont, so I've got clay, right? So you're seeing what I'm doing though, right? You can go through and then you can just start looking at this and this is gonna start giving you recommendations. It's gonna start giving you ideas for what you're looking at. This is a great tool. You can read about all of these. If you were to click on one, um, Amelanchor canadensis is our service berry. This is a great little tree. They're gonna show me beautiful pictures of what the tree looks like, of what the flower looks like, a nice description. And down here at the bottom, there might be a video, which is kind of cool. And there will also be the full kit and caboodle, right? I can learn everything about this tree, which is super cool. So this is a really nice resource. Um, it's definitely something to check out if you're at all interested in it. I love the plant toolbox, I really do. Um, it is an awesome resource. 
it's an awesome resource. So with that, I just want to end on one final thought, which is really about trees for wildlife. Um, I don't think anyone will be surprised to know that like I have a secret agenda here, which is to convince you to plant not only trees, but to plant native trees. They really do support more wildlife than um, almost anything else we can plant in our gardens. They're really phenomenal. And one thing to keep in mind is that you will see damage on your trees. You will see woodpeckers going for worms. You will see caterpillars creating holes. You will have uh, white-throated sparrows stealing your elm seeds, right? You will have all of this. And this is not actually a problem. This is a sign of a happy, healthy ecosystem. This is a sign that things are going well. Tree leaves will develop spots. It tends to mostly be um, aesthetic. If you have questions about your trees, any damage you're seeing on your trees, how to make them happier, healthier, anything, please reach out to me or the Master Gardeners. We'd love to work with you on it. But remember, they're gonna serve as the backbone for so much else that's going on in your garden. Um, and you kind of hope some critters will show up and give them a hard time because that means that the whole system is working. So with that, I am going to take any questions uh, and I will go ahead and Monica, do you have, are there any questions to take? There is one and I'm certain that the that people will, will jump in as they need to right after I ask you this one. But um, we, someone wants to know how to sterilize the pruning tools. Good call. Um, yeah, it's always a good idea to sterilize your pruning tools. I like to do, I'm a lazy sterilizer. So what I tend to do is I tend to go to the, to like, whatever store and I buy something that's somewhere in the like 70 to 90 percent range alcohol and I could dilute it down but uh, I don't always and what I will do is I will just put it in a spray bottle and I carry my pruners and my spray bottle with me and anytime I move between plants I just spray down my pruners with that alcohol and that tends to work pretty well I do it on everything from um, my weird gnarly invasive mulberry tree that I have mixed feelings about to my tomato plants right I sterilize between everything Ashley, can you put the um, slide that has the links to the plant websites either up again, or um, can you transfer that into the chat for them to save? There you go. How to contact the Tree Durham County Foresters, you call them. Yeah, so we have um, North Carolina Foresters that are shared between, I actually have their some of their old cars, cards. Uh, so the North Carolina Department of Agriculture um, has foresters, the uh, North Carolina Forest Service. We share an office with Orange County, um, but those guys will come out and they will take a look at your trees and they're really phenomenal. Um, I will say that if you are, the foresters will do a very, very, very good job looking at your tree, giving you ideas, but they still might recommend you to an arborist because you might need someone who can help you work through more thoroughly um, your problem. So oftentimes they will give you really good answers and really good ideas. But if you have a more kind of involved problem, you will still probably need an arborist. Ooh. Okay. Ash trees, let's just talk about it. Um, <laughs> uh, my name was actually because my mom was delighted by the fact that it meant one who lived in the ash woods. Uh, she didn't realize that everybody else in the late eighties was collectively deciding it was the best name too. <laughs> but <laughs> so um, the intervention that your arborist is likely recommending for your ash tree is an acceptable way to stave off emerald ash borer which is the major problem with ash trees. This is kind of like trying to change the pH of your soil. If you have a big tree that you love, I think it is completely reasonable to do treatments for emerald ash borer or to do iron tablets because your pH is wrong. However, you might wanna think about planting another tree <laughs> because the best plant time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The second best time is now and your tree will not survive forever. And that's really hard, but sometimes we make choices about our trees where we continue to um, work with them because we love them, but we know it's not gonna last forever. And so I would think about planting something else that can take over as that tree declines. Sorry. And that's all that we know of for questions at this time. Nice. Other than the usual fabulous job, Ashley. I try.
<laughs> um, you do. So let me know if you guys have any, um, Gail, I don't tell you anyone. I have an arborist I like, I'll tell you who it is later. <laughs> Not really allowed to recommend anyone, but I will say that um, the best place to look is to start, um, honestly, this sounds crazy. I actually really think neighborhood listservs or neighborhood lists or friend groups are really a good place to start asking around and then to verify credentials and to get references for people that people you know like because you know they've done good work, all of that, right? Like that sounds crazy, but that's how we find plumbers. That's how we find everything else. And then you verify it, you track it down, you make sure it's right. But so oftentimes, yeah. Have you, have you, I mean, when I had to have a tree taken down, the gentleman that came, two out of the three companies that I spoke to, two of them had arborists on staff that actually came out and, um, you know, talked to me about what, how I could handle this. So that was someplace, I mean, is someplace that one might start, especially if you're thinking you might have to take something down. Yeah, and it, taking something down can be, um, it can be quite expensive, but it, it is honestly actually, um, it can be quite dangerous work and the insurance that those people have to carry is, is pretty intense. So it's, um, it's always worth getting multiple quotes if you think the number is high, but the numbers can be high for someone who will do a good job. And, um, Having watched a, a tree cutter, not an arborist, knock off my neighbor's uh, chimney, I think it's worth paying someone who knows what they're doing, myself. Yeah, a tree in our neighborhood had to be craned over the house to get it out, out of the backyard, which, you know, I'm glad it wasn't my house, my yard, but. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fun uh, show to watch, not a fun show to pay for. <laughs> yeah, no. I had one topped. It's in, in the side yard where when it goes, it's not going to hurt anything. And I had it topped and there's all kinds of creatures living in that thing. I just wanted the habitat. Um, yeah, I, I will leave. I have a dead tree in my yard because it's good habitat. But, so awesome. I will stick around for a minute if anyone has questions, but it is eight o'clock and I know we all like our evenings, especially when there's still sunlight. Um, so uh, I'm going to stick around for a minute. I will be here with you, but if we're all finished asking questions, then we can go ahead and go. What was our um, high number? 39. Total or? Yes, that was the highest that it did reach. That's what I expect. That's actually better than I thought we would do for trees. Well, I don't think it's as good as your last couple of programs, but I think that's only because of the subject matter. I think that people truly don't think of no, gardening don't. with trees, but you present <laughs> amazing, compelling um, information for the future for planting trees for any any and all of us. Um, well, I, I think, think the good, the bad, and the bugly will be would be something that there'll be you'll have a little more interest in that. Yeah, that's one of my. I, I also just really wanted to talk about bugs at all times. Like, there's no, you never just to use the title. Yeah, it's just I was really delighted by the title last year, and I didn't get to use it. Yeah. And um, entertaining yourself. It's really what I'm here for. Um, I'm glad if I can bring you guys along for the ride, but uh. <laughs> no, no worries. We're having, so I think your number will probably, especially because we're going to be really getting in the beginning of bug season. I've already found babies, um, soft fly larvae eating the um, dinner plate hibiscus, you know, right. had to start insecticidal soaping in that. So I think that that'll be really timely. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's coming. It's definitely coming. This week like bought us time, but not much. Well, and here's the real disturbing thing. I have tons and tons of blooming plants and usually have a good um, solid number of bees working it by now. I don't have any. None. Really? I have noticed. Well, it's, it's really cool. But yeah, it's it'll be interesting to see if it picks up. It'll be interesting to see if it picks up. I, hope I, picks I'm, up. I am not... Um, I have some borer bees that are heading into the wood and, but they're not even working the flowers all that much. And, um, but there's no other kind of bee species. And I usually have, by now I usually have a bunch. So mm -hmm. my husband said the same thing about the, about the temperatures, but we've had some really warm days. There should, there's always been activity by now. So I think I'm gonna take a couple um, courses at state and um, you know, might have to just jump into becoming a beekeeper. I like it. 
It I think it's a totally reasonable my- solution. I didn't see bees for a couple of weeks. I'm going to start beekeeping. I, I Listen, this is scary. This is, I didn't realize how much happiness I got from watching bees love my plants. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. I, and now that they're not here, I'm just, I, I'm a little freaked out. Yeah. I think it's really fair. Hey, Joanne. Oh, there's Joanne. Okay, there was Joanne. Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. All, All right. right. Well, if that is that, then we Thank can so go ahead and end this meeting. Thanks, Monica. You're welcome. See you next time. It was outstanding, Ashley. There's Joanne. Thanks. I really just wanted to talk about branch subordination. It's like my favorite thing I've learned about <laughs> the last couple of years. I freaked out when I learned about that. <laughs> I, uh, Any idea how often we get to hear what your favorite things are? <laughs> It's really just a talk series organized around facts that I mean, I'm like you you're you're pe- you're preaching to the choir. There's no really, I mean, yeah, it's like the talk series. Like, have you heard this? <laughs> like that would be the title. <laughs> you I like it. I like it. Yeah, no, I well, so here's my last plant story. So okay, I so I was in grad school at Duke and I was in the development program. So we were studying just development of like people were studying development of all sorts of different things. And um I sat through an entire semester of development through cell movement because a lot of people were studying animals and humans and that kind of stuff, right? And so it's very, very relevant. And I was like at the end of the class and I was like, literally none of this applies to what I do. Like I just sat through an entire mandatory semester of something that cannot happen in the organism I study. Biologically, and I was just like, "That is a that is one of the craziest and most obvious." It was considered a foundational course for development, and it does not happen in plants. And I was like, "That is a really key key indicator of like how different plants and animals actually are." You will fix that, Dr. Troth, when you become faculty. And no, uh, I just loved it. I was like, "No wonder I couldn't do well on these exams." <laughs> anyway, oh. all right, I'm leaving for real. All bye. right, bye. <laughs>